So good evening. Welcome, everyone. This is in the long history of the Scottish Royal Met Society uh, history. This is our first ever hybrid meeting. Um, it's taken a long time to get here with uh, the last three years, but uh, it's good to be back in person and hopefully this works. Apologies for the slight delay. This is our first attempt. Thank you very much, Ken, for being our um, test man. Um, I'm Greg Wolverson. I'm the incoming chair of the, um, the Scottish Local Centre. Um, very briefly, I'd just like to pass our thanks to Gary Johnson um, as the outgoing chair for the last three years and uh, throughout the whole of COVID pretty much. So many thanks to Gary for, for chairing the committee and, uh, and the group for keeping us going. Um, so this is slightly new territory, but the talk will be recorded and put onto YouTube afterwards. Uh, I'm hoping that there's a question function online that we can um, answer questions and submit them there and I will try and um, and see a q a at the end um, as well as as well as the room so we've got a bit ahead of us but um our okay. best um so without any further ado i'd just like to introduce the speaker so um our speaker is ken mill tonight many thanks ken for making the travel up to, to edinburgh um, ken has worked at the met office for 39 years uh, mainly in research but including six years as a forecaster uh, over the past 25 years he has led the development of ensemble forecast at the met office and particularly its applications uh, until last year, he was the, uh, the head of verification and post-processing in weather science. Over, the, over, those, over those years, Ken has helped to demonstrate the probabilistic forecasts, provide greater pre prediction skill, and can support better decision making. Uh, Ken is now a science fellow with a primary focus to support the use of ensemble and probabilistic forecasts in Met Office products and services. Yes, it's come in now. So our talk tonight that we're all very much looking forward to uh, is titled Ensemble and Probabilistic Forecast. Um, in the interest of time, Ken, I'll pass to you, I think, in this case, introduce the talk and, and, and the floor is yours. Brilliant, thank you very Well, thank you ever so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm a good Scot, I was born in Edinburgh myself, so it's nice to be home. Um, and uh, one or two of you may remember that Marjorie invited me to speak here about ensemble forecasting. I think it must have been about 15 years or so ago. So it's not my first time, but things have moved on a little bit since then. So uh, I will, I'm hoping to bring you up to date a bit. So uh, just before I um, launch into the talk itself, I should give my thanks to, as it says, innumerable colleagues in the Met Office and beyond. Um, I've been collaborating internationally on ensemble science for those more than 25 years, um, but also, of course, a huge number of colleagues in the Met Office have played a huge part in turning my vision into reality, doing all the technical clever stuff that I didn't know how to do. Um, so this is, I'm giving the talk, but this is very much the product of many, many people's work over many, many years. Um, so we've had ensemble forecasting, believe it or not, for more than 30 years. Um, I mean, even before this, actually, the idea was first discovered, sort of invented by Tim Palmer and um, James Murphy to address long range forecasting. But in 1992, ECMWF and NSEP in the United States both started medium range ensemble forecasting running, not operationally, but in real time. Uh, so that's more than 30 years, 31 years ago. The first regional ensemble using a higher resolution model nested in global models that I'm aware of was the Cosmo LEP system, um, which is run by the regional Met service in Emilia Romagna in northern Italy. Uh, and that started around about 1999. Um, the Met Office's first uh, ensemble, which I led the development of, um, was is the MoGrep, well, it is the MoGrep system, it's still the MoGrep system. Um, we first run our, our first regional ensemble with a global ensemble as well to provide the boundary conditions in 2005. So we've been doing it for a long time. We introduced our first convective scale model ensemble. That's a, a model where the grid points are sufficiently close together to be able to resolve convective storms in 2012, just in time to demonstrate it at the London 2012 Olympics. Literally just in time, one month before we actually started running it. Um, and much more recently, we've just introduced uh, a brand new 
post-processing system, which is really designed to get the most out of the high resolution ensemble forecast that we run now. And I've been leading the development of that over about the last six to seven years. Um, so we've been at this for a very long time. Uh, this is that's just a few examples out of uh, what the improver system can produce. So the, what I want to talk about today is how we actually make use of this, uh, where we are with it and how we make use of it. So here's a very quick outline of, what, of the talk. I'll give a, a very, very brief introduction to numerical weather prediction and, and ensembles as to how we use them. Uh, but I, I will start from the real basics, just in case there are one or two people who don't know how we do it. I'll talk about the operational systems that the Met Office runs now. There are, of course, many other operational systems around the world. I haven't got time to go into all of those, but I'll talk about the Met Office ones. Um, I'll then focus a little bit on post-processing and how we turn these into useful probabilistic probability forecasts, uh, and then talk about more about exploitation of them, how we make good use of these. Uh, and then one slide to just look a bit ahead to the future. So, real back to basics. How do we do weather forecasting? Well, of course, it all starts from observations. The first thing we have to know is what state is the atmosphere in now so that we can then project that forward. So, wealth of different types of observations that we use, of course, illustrated here with satellite, but there are many, many others. And then we have to know how the atmosphere works. We have to understand the physics of the atmosphere. Um, so, of course, we've got the primitive equations and all the equations that describe the various aspects of the physics and that sort of thing, which we build together into a very sophisticated computer model to simulate how the atmosphere works. And we run that on a giant supercomputer. Um, we simulate the atmosphere on a set of grid points. This is a very old picture, and they're much, much closer together than that, of course. Um, but horizontally, and through the vertical. And out of the supercomputer, then we get guidance information from the model, uh, which goes to the forecasters and uh, is interpreted. Um, it's turned into risk analysis, for example, and it's communicated. That's the basics of the weather forecast process. But the key things here we're interested in are using the observations to set up the initial state with the model. The model calculates how we how we go forward. And so now we have some incredibly sophisticated models. Now this is actually slightly more further ahead than the current operational model. This is a, a simulation um, with, uh, um, no, it's not it's an 80 kilometer resolution um, global model simulating the whole world. And you can see things which look like very realistic uh, weather patterns evolving, and this is all a model simulation. So this is incredibly sophisticated. It really looks like a real satellite sequence. Uh, and this is where we are with the models now. They can resolve incredible detail, and you can see thunderstorms in the tropics and that sort of thing. Actually, I, th I think this is high resolution. I think this is um, to some extent convection resolving in the tropics. Um, and then this is actually a very, very old image, but it is basically the resolution that we run over the UK now. And what you've got here is what looks like a radar picture on the left and what looks like a, sorry, on the right, and the, what looks like a satellite sequence on the left. But this is a pure model simulation um, of uh, a, a deep storm system over the, over the British Isles. And this is the still resolution of the model that we run over the British Isles. It has evolved quite a bit scientifically since this picture was done, but this is the same basic resolution. And these are this is a model which the grid points are sufficiently close together that we can resolve convective storms. And you can see lots of showers and things within that system. So these are the, the tools that we're working with. Um, here's just another sequence of this high resolution UK model. And you can see that it shows incredible detail. But not all of that detail is predictable. Particularly when we look at the showers and that sort of thing, we can't, don't expect these showers to be in the right places at the right times, for example. And there's other aspects of it which are not in, uh, predictable either. And we'll come to that in more detail. So, one of the issues that we have to deal with is, of course, chaos theory. And uh, this all goes back to this very famous statement 
uh, from Ed Lorenz in his The Essence of Chaos, one flap of a seagull's wings may forever change the future course of the weather. Um, there was, of course, another version of that about a butterfly in the Amazon uh, in Brazil, I think it was, uh, triggering a tornado in Texas. Uh, it's the same, from the same guy, basically the same idea. Um, but how does that manifest itself in reality? Again, this is a very, very old picture that I created when I was first working on ensemble forecasting, but it works. Um, we've got two almost identical starting conditions for a forecast up there. The eagle eyed about, and you might spot there's a slight difference in the contours in the top left hand corner with an extra closed contour up there. Is that what matters? Who knows? But if you run those forward in time, four days, you get two completely different forecasts for the UK. You don't need to be a very expert meteorologist to know that uh, this one is going to give you uh, very stormy, wet and windy conditions over the British Isles, whereas this one, low pressure is much weaker and up in, into Scandinavia. We're in a cold northerly, fairly stable over Scotland. Completely different weather. So it doesn't make any sense to give a deterministic forecast saying it is going to be stormy over, over the British Isles, for example. Um, and that's the challenge that the nature of the atmosphere, the chaotic nature of the atmosphere uh, presents us with. Now, here's another example, two forecasts, same one you saw before, plus another one started from marginally different situations. And they start out quite similar. But if you watch the animation running for longer, you will see that they get more and more different as we go through time. Um, Starting to get some different differences now, particularly in this low pressure coming right down over the country now on the right hand screen. Now we've got a front coming in in the west. Oh, it's quite a few frames later in the uh, in the other frame. Um, so you can see the uncertainty in the forecast drawing as we go through time. And so that's the chal all the challenge that chaos, chaos theory gives us in, in, in weather forecasting. So Ensemble forecasting is our approach to try to deal with this, the effect of chaos. Uh, this is a schematic diagram that I came up with many years ago to kind of try and explain on, what ensemble forecasting is all about. So what we're doing is we're going from left of the screen to right, we're going forward in time. Just a schematic of how we do a forecast. So we start, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, with an analysis produced from all the observations. An analysis is a model state of a best estimate that we can give of the current state of the atmosphere. And looking forward, before we run our forecast, the only limits we know on what the forecast might be are climatology. Climatology, what happens typically, tells you, for example, that now in Edinburgh at this time of year, we're not going to get a temperature of 40 degrees. We're also not going to get a temperature of minus 10 degrees in, in, in October. Um, of course, climate is changing <laughs> now, but it's the best estimate we've got without doing anything else. Traditionally, we run a single deterministic forecast, started from that analysis, and that gives us a forecast, a picture of what might happen. But we've just seen from the examples I've just shown you that we can't entirely trust that. What we do know quite a bit actually about is how good this analysis is. We know how good our observations are. We know what the observation errors typically are. The other th thing that we use is the, um, the pr a previous forecast is also used in producing the analysis. We also know reasonably well how good that previous forecast is. So given those those background errors from the model, from the previous forecast, and the observation errors, we can make a pretty good estimate of how good that analysis is. So what we do in an ensemble forecast is that we make, we make what we call perturbations, small changes to that analysis within that area of uncertainty, and then run a whole set of forecasts. And that gives us a sampling of what the forecast uncertainty is. In this case, showing us um, a large part of climatology. Hopefully, most of the time, it's a rather smaller sex, uh, subset of climatology than that, but it, it, it can vary. So that's a schematic of what ensemble forecasting is all about, really. We, we, we make perturbations around the analysis 
and in fact also to we make some perturbations to, to the model physics itself as well. Um, small changes which affect the model physics as it's running because there is uncertainty in that as well. Now I mentioned Ed Lorentz, the discoverer of chaos, uh, and he at the time was back in 1963 was using a very simple three variable model um, to experiment with extrapolating forward in time with a model. But the important thing was that his model, the equations of his model were chaotic. And they produced this set of points, what's called an attractor, um, which the equations will only solve if you step forward in time to points on this attractor. And it has this sort of butterfly shaped shape or with two sort of lobes. And this particular experiment here was done by Tim Palmer, who's one of the uh, world leading leaders of ensemble forecasting, um, worked many years at ECMWF, is now a professor at Oxford. Um, and what Tim did here was did ensemble forecasts within the Lorentz, track, the Lorentz model. So in the top picture, you can see he started from a place up at the top left hand corner and started from a whole set of points there and ran the model forward. And in every case, they all went to the same sort of area in the right hand lobe. Um, and that actually was showing a great deal of predictability. But if you start it just a little bit further in from this point here, then it diverges into, uh, it's predictable at first, but then it starts splitting and you get a proportion of the, for, the forecast going in here and a proportion of points going off into the other lobe. If you start here in the bottom right hand picture, um, you see that very quickly it becomes split between the two lobes. So if you're trying to forecast which lobe you're going to be in after a number of time steps, um, you could be um, very predictable, predictable for a while, and then, then you have to look at probabilities of it, or you could be having to look at probabilities of it in a very short time. There's a nice illustration of how a chaotic system, the predictability depends on the starting state. And the atmosphere is the same. Which is one of the reasons why we run ensembles, because of course you could get an estimate of uncertainty in a forecast, just by looking at the past errors of forecasts and then adding a probability distribution to a forecast. But that doesn't, that would then be fixed uncertainty every time, whereas an ensemble will give you the variable uncertainty. It depends on the state. So here's an example of an ensemble forecast. Um, and by running the, the, the atmospheric computer model multiple times with slightly different starting conditions, uh, we try to produce a set of equally likely solutions. And from this, we can try and take account of the uncertainty in the forecast. We can assess the confidence in the forecast. How confident should we be in this forecast? We can try and estimate probabilities. So at the most basic level, if nine out of 36 members are forecasting something to happen, then we reckon it's a 25% chance of that happening. Um, and this provides us the, you can also use the ensemble mean, which talked about quite a lot, which by some measures gives you the best deterministic forecast. However, I always caution strongly about using the ensemble mean, because when you average all these numbers together, you will never get an extreme forecast. And that's actually what we care about most about usually. We really want to be sure we can capture extreme events when they happen. So the ensemble mean should not be used on its own. Um, with those same members, if you combine them all together, then you produce the probability, uh, so just as I said, taking the proportion of members which forecast something to happen. This particular example is the probability of 30 knots, of gusts exceeding 30 knots, wind gusts exceeding 30 knots. Uh, so the colors on the right hand plot there don't show the uh, wind speed, but the probability that the wind speed will exceed 30 knots. So just like to show you a couple of examples of this working in reality. And this is from the, uh, the high resolution uh, MoGreps UK ensemble, um, which we run over the UK. Uh, and this case comes from the East from the East storm, um, which is a few years ago now, but it's a really, really nice example. Um, and so you can see there's uh, a 18 different forecasts there. 
uh, animating through time. And you can see um, at the early stage of the forecast, some very common features between all of them. But then particularly as you get later on in the forecast, you see some big differences in this storm that comes up in the southwest of England and up towards Ireland. Um, so what we see here um, is high confidence for lots of snow showers on the east coast, but much more uncertainty on the storm effect in the southwest. If we just freeze that at the, at the last frame of that, you can see how we've got a high predict a predictable situation for all the showers down the east coast, uh, up in the northeast and the Scottish coast, and down into northeast England, whereas we have uh, much less predictability for the big snowstorm into the southwest. So that's an example of what I was just saying about varying predictability uh, for different parts of the forecast. So this is actually from the global ensemble rather than from the that regional one. But uh, this is showing for that same event, uh, six, five, four, three, and two day forecasts of the probability of get it right, I think it was greater than five centimeters of snow over 24 hours. Um, and so you can see that in the early stages of the forecast, you've got a broad picture of, actually in this case, moderate probabilities of, of snowfall, um, with a little bit higher in part of the southwest there. And as we get move forward in time through the forecast, we narrow down the area, but the probabilities get more, more uh, intense. So basically, as you get closer to the event, the uncertainty decreases and you get higher probabilities uh, and greater confidence in your forecast, which is what you would expect. Um, so that was a nice example. OK, so that's an introduction to what ensemble forecasting is all about, how we do it. Um, just very, very quickly tell you about the operational systems that we run. I've mentioned I've touched on them already a little bit, but we run uh, a global ensemble uh, covering the whole globe. Um, and uh, well, we run at the moment a 10 kilometer deterministic model and a 20 kilometer ensemble with 36 members. Um, actually, with 18 members run every six hours, but we combine the last cycles from the last two six, uh, six hour cycles together to give a 36 member ensemble um, for the globe. Then that provides the boundary conditions for a UK ensemble. This is the full domain of the model. It uses a, a, a high, lower resolution than the outer boundary and then in a central um, area with, well, it's one and a half kilometer resolution for the deterministic, 2.2 kilometers for the ensemble. Um, and that ensemble produces us 18 members every, uh, every, every, every six hours. We actually run it as three members every hour, and then we combine together the, the last six cycles, which means we get an update to the ensemble probabilities every hour. We throw away the oldest cycle and bring in another cycle of three members every hour. Uh, so that's the operational systems that we run. As from 2025, we're taking a massive step. Essentially what I might say I've been trying to build us into the position to do for the last 25 years or so that I've been working on ensemble forecasting is to get the method to the position where we're no longer going to be running a se separate higher resolution deterministic forecast. Our, on, our weather prediction system will be an entirely ensemble based system. What we're going to do is increase the resolution of the ensembles to the resolution that the current deterministic models run at, but we will cease to run a separate higher resolution deterministic model, both in the global and in the UK. Um, so this is a huge step that we are moving to an ensemble on the NWP system. Um, interestingly, ECMWF, the European Centre for Meteor Management Weather Forecasts, um, has taken the decision to do the same thing at almost the same time, but taking that decision completely independently of us. Um, they, but for similar reasons, of course. Um, so that's an exciting future. Okay, so 
we've got these systems running. As you can imagine, they produce huge quantities of data. So what do we do with all of that? And how do we use it in forecasting? Well, so I started to think about how we post-process this data to um, turn it into useful forecasts. I want to just think particularly about the, the high resolution UK forecasts for a moment. And away from ensembles to start with, but just using the high resolution deterministic model. Here's a model forecast on the left and on the right, uh, a radar picture for the same time. And if you look at those, first of all, you think, oh, that's a pretty good forecast. Scattering of showers in the right part of the country looks pretty good. But if you actually take those showers uh, from the model and they overlay them on the radar picture, you see that they're actually in completely different places. So if you did a conventional verification of this forecast and said, it went to a whole lot of good points and said, is it raining and did we forecast it? You'd say that's a terrible forecast. But of course, we see it's not really a terrible forecast because it's got showers in the right part of the country. So um, it's much better to interpret that in a probabilistic sense. What's the probability that you're going to have a, have a shower near you? And we can do that even with a deterministic model by what we call neighborhood processing. So supposing we're interested in the forecast for this place marked with a cross. Uh, in a grid, so we're so we're talking about uh, this is a uh, part of the the grid boxes of the model. So we're interested in a place that's in that particular grid box, and rather than saying just, well, is the model forecasting a shower in that spot or not? We actually look at a neighborhood of points around about it. We're illustrating it here with nine boxes around it, but in practice, we probably use a slightly bigger uh, neighborhood than that. Uh, and then instead of just looking at that one grid box, we treat all those boxes around it as a, as a sort of nine member ensemble for that box. So actually, we can turn even the deterministic model into a probability forecast. And so in this case, supposing that two of those nine boxes were forecasting rain to be happening, then you'd say the probability was 32% of rain happening in that box. We do the same thing with an 18 member ensemble. And suddenly we've turned that 80 member ensemble into 1,458 member ensembles. And you can get much nicer forecasts. So here is what that looks like in practice. Here we have an ensemble of forecasts on a very, very showery day. So you can see piles of showers coming down over the country um, and quite a variety in intensities and in some places clumping of more organized showers and things in certain parts, but in some members, not others. And so quite a, a lot of uncertainty there. But if you just take all those uh, 18 forecasts, no, 12 forecasts is, in, is there, 12 forecasts, and just take each grid box and say, what's the probability of that grid box? Then you get something that looks like that. And you can see that a 12 member ensemble or even an 18 member ensemble is nothing like enough to really sample that uncertainty. So you get this, still get a very, very speckly pattern, um, which none of you would think actually represents the real probabilities. But when we apply that neighborhood processing to that as well, it says, machine to do it, then you get a much smoother uh, pattern of probabilities. Still got some speckliness in it. Particularly in um, where there's some um, where there's fewer members forecasting something, but a much much smoother and more realistic picture of the, uh, the probabilities. And this is how we go about processing the, the high resolution ensemble to get good probabilities out of it. At the beginning, I mentioned we've been developing this new post processing system called Improver, and that's uh, this is one of the things which Improver does. Improver does a lot of things, which but one of the things is it provides this sort of um, steady high resolution post processing to get the most out of the high resolution models. Now, Improver is a system that's designed to blend together a number of different inputs, particularly different inputs at different forecast lead times, to give us the best single forecast we can get at every lead time 
at the moment it runs from one hour ahead out to a week ahead um, on one of the, the upgrades reasonably soon it'll be going out to two weeks ahead but at the moment it's only out to one week ahead and so we bring in an outcast uh, an extrapolation but only, mainly for rain, only for rainfall at the moment but an extrapolation of rainfall, radar rainfall out to uh, a few a couple of hours ahead a few hours ahead we use the deterministic high resolution model we use the 18 member MOGREPS UK ensemble, and we use the uh, 36 member MOGREPS G ensemble, the global ensemble, for um, particularly for the, the longer days ahead, for the days further ahead. I should have said, by the way, that MOGREPS UK, the UK ensemble, um, runs out to five days. Uh, now, the general sort of perceived wisdom was for many years that running these very high resolution models, it only made sense to do it for a day, a day and a half, maybe two days at the most. But I argued that for uh, when you were looking you know, with an ensemble, and so you were looking at the uncertainty as well, then it did make sense to run it out to five days. And that's what we do. So all of those are fed into the system that we call Improver. So it's ingesting a huge amount of data from all these different models. And out of it, it produces probability pictures, ways of looking at the, the probability distribution. And it works for a whole range of different variables. It works for temperatures and winds and wind speeds and gusts and visibilities and precipitation, rain, snow, sleet, uh, hail, etc. It's processing loads of different variables. And for each of these, it produces um, the same information actually in two forms. It produces probabilities of exceeding various thresholds. So, for example, the, what's illustrated here is temperatures, probability of temperature exceeding zero, one, two, three, four degrees, up probably 20 degrees. And by having all those thresholds, you can describe the whole probability distribution. You can give exactly the same information as a set of percentile points. So, for example, the median in the middle is a good estimate of the most likely temperature. One end, you've got the fifth percentile, the other the 95th percentile. So there's only a 5% chance of temperature being more than that, or a 5% chance of being less than that. And we store all that information. Another way of describing the same information, in fact. And then we can plot those into, uh, into images. Um, and uh, so we can do maps, or we can extract site forecasts of the probabilities of all these events. Here is just a very, very small sample of all the range of products and things that we can get out of the improver system. This, these are all actually for the exactly the same time in the same forecast. It was a case where there was um, snow over the British Isles, and then a warm front spreading in from the west, um, bringing milder air in. So for example, you can see here, this is a probability of 95th percentile of a one hour snow accumulation there. Um, and on which is all towards the east, here's the 90th percentile of the precipitation rate. So you can see a whole lot of more precipitation coming in from the west, but that's just rain, and not snow. Uh, so just a, a little snapshot of all the whole range of different types of things that we can get. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of risk here and just jump out of my presentation for a moment. Hopefully, you can tell me if this is working online all right. Um, are you seeing that online? Good. Um, so this, I've just jumped for a moment to the live improver system, just to show you what it looks like. And I've preset it up with the current forecast for, on the right, the probability of more than one millimeter in an hour. And on the left, this is the um, 95th percentile of one hour precipitation accumulation. So they're both showing one hour precipitation accumulation. That's a probability of getting some, more than a millimeter. This is the highest amount that you might expect to see at every individual grid point. You will never see a 95th percentile pattern. You'll never get the 95th percentile everywhere at the same time. But at any one place, that's telling you what's the sort of worst case scenario you might get. And if we run that forward in time, should run, hopefully. There you are. I can see the two of them animating together. So there's a live forecast coming out of the improver system, which is driven mostly from the MoGreps UK ensemble. 
as it gets towards the end, the last two days of the animation will be dissolving into the, the global ensemble, producing the same information. You can see down the left hand side here, all the range of different variables and things that we could pull up. And for each of those, we could pull up uh, our whole variety of different probability thresholds and things. So there's an immense amount of information in this system, which is all available to our forecasters to use. Or as they will tell me online, they'll tell me off for calling them forecasters. We call them operational meteorologists nowadays. <laughs> right, that was just a very quick illustration, and I will try to jump back to the uh, PowerPoint. Has that come back properly on the online? Oh, great, OK. So one of the things we need to do, always with our forecasts, is verify them, measure how good they are. When you're verifying a probability forecast, you're measuring something completely different from when you're verifying a deterministic forecast. Because, of course, as people will often tell you, oh, well, you can never be wrong with a probability forecast, can you? You're just covering your own backs, which, well, there is some truth in that. But the important thing is that the, the, uh, the probabilities that we give do have to relate to how likely something is to happen. You cannot verify an individual probability forecast. You have to verify many, many forecasts. And if out of all the times that, for example, that you forecast 30% chance that something will happen, then it should happen on 30% of those occasions. Equally, out of all the times you forecast 80%, it should happen on 80% of those times. That's the sort, an example of the sort of thing you, you measure when you verify a probability forecast. I haven't got time to go into lots of detail about verification. There are a whole range of different scores and things that we can and do use. But what I want to show you here is just one example. Um, this is using a relatively new verification method that we use. It actually uses a neighborhood approach around, in the same way I described to you neighborhood processing in, in, in post-processing, we also use this in verification here. We look at a, an observation site and we, we look at the neighborhood of points around there so that we can do a fair probabilistic um, verification of, of, of a forecast. And one of the things nice about this tool is it lets us do a fair comparison between a deterministic model, which is actually shown here in the blue. It's the UKV high resolution deterministic model at 1.5 kilometer resolution with an ensemble forecast, in this case the MoGreps UK, slightly lower resolution ensemble. So what we're, um, we are turning the UK deterministic forecast into probabilities using neighbourhoods, so we can do a fair comparison between the two. And we've got graphics here from three different variables, precipitation, temperature and wind speed. We are, we're, we're looking here at detailed local UK weather. So we're looking at surface weather variables. We're not look, just verifying the 500 millibar height or something like that. We're looking at local weather. And the uh, all the spiky lines going up and down are, 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 are one month scores. The more solid ones going through the middle of that are, um, re, uh, that we get 12 month averages. Um, so they're of more interest in some ways. You can see that the scores are quite variable from month to month. But these are scores. This is um, using a score called the continuous ranked probability score, which is a slightly more sophisticated score of, of which measures our ability to forecast probabilities across a wide range of thresholds. And um, the higher up the graph, the better. That's something you always have to think about on a, on a verification score, which way is best. And so you can see that the red, the MoGreps UK, is consistently better for all three of these variables than the deterministic forecast. So this is as close as we can get to a really fair verification which demonstrates that ensemble forecasts have greater predictive skill than the deterministic equivalents. And this is why we want to, that, this is the skill we want to exploit in, uh, into our products and services to get the, the benefit of this huge amount of computer power that we're investing in running ensembles. Um, one other thing that's worth pointing out is this, these vertical lines represent times where we've done system upgrades. 
And this that's just an upgrade that we did there, what we call Parallel Suite 42, uh, was when we introduced the hourly cycling in the WorldGreps UK ensemble. And if you look carefully, you can see that from that point onwards, the gap between the two has increased. So that was a significant upgrade to the ensemble, which uh, made a significant improvement in the benefits of the ensemble. OK, so for the remainder of the talk, I want to think now about what we're doing in the Met Office to make more use of these ensembles. Um, like many big organizations, the Met Office has a strategy. We implement a lot of our strategy um, through what we call strategic actions. These are concentrated focus of work across the whole organization to try and achieve certain aims. And we are currently running a strategic action on ensemble exploitation. Uh, and I'm helping to lead that part of that uh, program. And so this is a Met Office wide strategic action to ensure that all of our products and services are underpinned by our ensemble forecasting systems, to make better use of them across our advice and our services, and to ensure that we're developing our forecasting systems in the future, recognizing how ensembles are used. So in other words, it's not just about use, it's also feeding right back into development of the systems so that we're improving the science of the ensembles as well. So why are we doing this? What's the problem? I tried to describe to, we, to you, we're investing huge quantities of public money uh, in investing in running ensembles. You probably heard that we've, uh, our latest supercomputer, which is on the process of coming online at the moment, cost the government 1.2 billion pounds over 10 years. It's a huge amount of money. A huge part of the business case for that was to be able to run high resolution ensembles. So I've had a lot of responsibility on me to make sure we get good use of that for the taxpayers' money. Uh, I and, my, and all my colleagues as well, of course. We have delivered the promises on the supercomputer. We've built the ensemble, we've made them work, we've demonstrated with the verification that they provide greater skill. We've done the science, if you like. We've also done, and I'll touch a little bit more on this in a minute, a lot of research on how we can use this. Can people make decisions from probabilistic forecasts? Because right from an early stage in doing ensemble forecasting, we realized that we were going to have to be issuing probabilistic forecasts. Would people understand these? And we've done a lot of research which has shown that, yes, they do. But when we actually try and use them, we tend to come up against questions of, oh, well, users just want a decision. They just want a yes, no answer. We don't know how to use it, so we can't explain it to customers. The ensemble doesn't tell the story I want to tell. There's too much data. The public won't understand. So if you look at our app forecast at the moment, you'll find that nearly all of it is still deterministic. We do have a probability of precipitation in there, but everything else is still deterministic. Same on our website. Um, you don't get very much of this yet. So this is the problem that we're trying to address as a strategic action, try and make more use of them overcome some of these hurdles and barriers that we come across. So I mentioned it just now. One of the assumptions, I find that when we're talking about new products and services, um, the conversation virtually always starts with somebody in the rooms piping up and saying, well, people don't understand probabilities, so we can't do that. It's an assumption that people just work from. But is this an established fact? Is there evidence for it? Or is it just an assumption? It's really important because such a state it sets the whole scene for uh, the products and services, and narrows down the options before we even start. As I said, it's not a new topic. I've actually been commissioning research on this for um, 20 years more. Um, I actually recruited a very, very clever mathematician called Mark Rolston into my team as a consultant back in 2005 to do research precisely on this. Um, he didn't stay with us for all that long, but he did start off a lot of uh, the, the, the process um, and produced a few papers. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details on here, but we've done uh, various different uh, experiments in collaboration with academics. For example, we did this, what we called the weather game, where we got people to play an online game making decisions from forecasts that we presented them with, 
um, which we did in collaboration with David Spiegelhalter, who you may have come across as professor from Cambridge on public understanding of, uh, of risk. And um, that was very, very successfully demonstrated that actually people do make better decisions if you give them more information. And I recently wrote a, uh, did, a, did a literature review of all the research that's been done in this field. And headline summary out of that review is that the overwhelming and consistent conclusion found in the literature is that people do understand the probabilities information and make better decisions when you give it to them. Yes, as a caveat, you have to present it appropriately so that you do need to think about it, but it should not be an obstacle to not using them. So the vision for our strategic action is very much to do this. Um, so we are, we are already using ensembles. We use them internally in that, but we want to fully exploit and extract the, extract the maximum value from the ensemble systems for underpinning of all of our services in order to support our users and customers in the decision-making, particularly in terms of high-risk uh, and high-impact weather events. Um, transforming the, the system that we're running from a primarily deterministic system to a primarily ensemble-based system, which, from which we can still de extract deterministic forecasts if we need to. Um, increasing the number of forecasts and services, exploiting the ensembles, uh, engaging with our customers to help them exploit them better, and make more use of them because we do have to have this what we call a co-development process where we work with the customers to understand their decisions and then work out the best way to help them make those decisions um, then also developing our models um, uh, to recognizing the requirements of the ensembles um, and also working on one or two things like common language and we also have to change the culture of the organization so I won't go into the detail here, we've got, it's a big project. We've got um, several different work packages. We've got underpinning research uh, on, how, on how to make best use of ensembles. We've got improving the ensemble development itself. That's right into the science. We've got the tools and systems and things that the uh, people like the operational forecasters use to interact with the data, um, training them as well, so people development. Um, and then we've got engaging and supporting with our, our users. And there's also a communicating uh, work package, which is communicating the whole thing, both internally and externally, is really important. This is a big thing going right across the organization. One of the things that we've been doing, we, this, this is a, came out of, as it looks like, a sort of brainstorming session that we ran on different ways of using an ensemble. So you get a probability distribution out of an ensemble. So this is some element like temperature or wind speed or whatever along here, probability of it happen, of different ones happening. And you can break that down into, you've got a set of percentile points marked by the crosses, but you can cut, make a cutoff here at a particular value. What's the probability of exceeding that value? Um, and uh, that's an illustration of some of the ways you can extract information from probability. But equally, you can, look at the forecast running forward through time and see how the different forecasts cluster together. Are there clusters which indicating a high probability that's going to be something like that? Or are there outliers? Uh, and how do we handle, we'll make use of those? Apologies, we started slightly late, so I understand if people need to leave. Um, and I won't be too much longer. So out of that, we've come up with a range of different use cases of how we, um, dif different ways of using an ensemble forecast. The top row, basically all based on using this probability distribution. Um, it might be that we uh, are just trying to extract, a, still, still trying to extract a, a best estimate deterministic forecast from it. But sometimes that's still what you need. The first use actually of the improver system I showed you is going to be driving our Wet our phone app and our web uh, web forecasts. Initially, they will still be the same deterministic forecast you're used to, but the data will be extracted from the ensemble to kind of give you the best estimate from the ensemble, hopefully be a better one. But then you can add error bars to the, those deterministic figures by using, say, the 95th and 5th percentile. Uh, or you can show a map of probabilities of something happening. 
So those are all directly from the probability distribution on the, on the first line. Yes, so many of you will be familiar with our National Severe Weather Warning Service, yellow, red, uh, yellow, amber, red warnings. Um, this example here uh, is the warnings for Storm Eunice back in 2022, red warnings for wind in the south, uh, yellow for snow over Scotland, uh, amber for wind in the middle, a uh, pretty big storm. Um, some of you will, some of you may not be aware of the impact matrix which goes behind this. You have to dig quite a bit into our website to find the impact matrix. But these warnings are uh, impact based. So they're trying, they're, they're basing the warning on how severe we think the impact might be, which is this axis along here, combined with how likely it is up here. So you can immediately see where the ensemble is potentially useful. Your chairman, Greg, of course, is. Uh, very familiar with these because he's a large part of his day job is communicating these to many of our customers. Um, so, for example, uh, an AMRA warning could be uh, a high probability of a medium impact, but it could also be uh, a, a low to moderate impact, uh, sorry, probability of a high impact. Um, so the, the probabilities are important in this. And we have built a system uh, which uses the ensembles directly to, for, to, to, to give a first guess estimate of colors for the matrix from the ensemble. Um, as far as the impacts concerned, it's worth saying that the impacts that we use vary across the country according to how different climates in different parts of the country, and also to some extent how popular, heavily populated they are. Um, but I won't go into details of that now. So the ensembles can be useful in helping the forecasters to decide how to issue these warnings. A nice example came last summer when we had the record breaking temperatures of 40 degrees, because this was a four day ahead forecast from our global ensemble of exceeding 38 degrees Celsius which is a phenomenal temperature. That's four days ahead. Two days ahead, this is the probability from Improver of exceeding 40 degrees. And you can see high probabilities up this region here, which is just where it happened. You can see how closely the red warning area that was issued, um, two days ahead, I think it was issued. Um, no, it's actually four days ahead. It's tied to the probabilities that the ensembles were giving us. One of the things that the ensemble did here was the ensemble was giving really high probabilities, even four days ahead. Remember right back at the beginning, I told, talked about variable uncertainty. Sometimes things are quite, you can be confident about them. Sometimes there's much more uncertainty. The ensembles here gave us the confidence because all the ensemble members were giving the same sort of signal. So the ensembles gave us the confidence to issue a red warning earlier than we'd ever issued a red warning before. Um, so the ensembles are really important in, in, in being able to issue those warnings in good time. When I showed you that um, sort of brainstorming session we had, I talked about looking at different scenarios, a most likely cluster of, cluster of members all doing something similar, but then some outliers from it. There's lots of ways of trying to cluster the members of an ensemble to try and summarize the information. The way that we found most successful is a system that we call Decider. We have a predefined set of weather patterns looking at the large scale flow, which sort of characterize the different types of weather we have in the, in the British Isles. And what we do is we match our ensemble members. This is for the medium range forecast. This is we're looking several days ahead. We match each ensemble member to which of these patterns they fit the best. And then we present the forecast to our operational meteorologists in this sort of tabular form where you've got the, the different weather types up the left hand side and how many ensemble members or what percentage of ensemble members are matching each of these at different days ahead through the forecast. And so you can see initially one type up there, then high confidence over the next couple of days for a different regime. Um, and then 
high confidence for this one here, but we start to see more variability as we go further ahead. That's actually quite high, high confidence uh, forecast all the way through. But this has been a really successful way in trying to define these different um, weather types, which would allow, say, Alex or Aidan, our media presenters, to be able to say, well, it most likely going to do this, but it could do this, produce different scenarios. There they are doing it. There's Alex actually presenting some stuff. So one of the, the nice things these guys do, we lost the contract to BBC a few years ago, as you probably know. Uh, at the same time, we set up our own media unit, which produces our own broadcasts on our web and on our app. And one of the things that Alex and Aidan do is that they produce longer uh, broadcasts, what we call deep dives and 10 day trend forecasts, where they take a bit longer to explain things in detail. They've done a brilliant job of showing ensembles in these, talking the public through them and helping to explain to the public some of the science behind what we do with ensemble forecasts. I mentioned at one point earlier that a really big focus of our work is I'm trying to improve our forecasts of more high impact events, more extreme events. Um, things, sort of thing that cause flooding in, in, in London underground stations, heavy rain. And often this comes from convective storms, heavy convective storms. And you can get situations where you've got just a low probability over a very wide area. You can't pinpoint where they're going to be very well. But so you see here, we've got lots of low probabilities, nothing very exciting to catch your eye on. But we have, through the improved approach processing system, we can do a bit more by trying to look at, so not just what's the probability of something right where I am, but what's the probability of something within a vicinity around where I am? Probability of a storm being within 10 miles of me or 20, 30 miles of me. And this can start to highlight better where the highest risks are and, and, and give you slightly higher probabilities that are, are more akin to people making decisions. Right, I'm kind of conscious that we did start a bit late, but I'm kind of over my time. So I think I probably ought to wrap up. Um, this is a beautiful picture of an ensemble of river forecasts from different rainfall scenarios. You see the animations running quite fast, but each one is a different ensemble member. So each one's a little bit different. As an example of using all the members of the ensemble to try and do probabilistic flood forecasting. Um, not a thought about ways that we might present more information to the public in the future. Um, these are just ideas that we're thinking about. I said I was going to finish up with one slide on the future. And um, this is actually, there's some really exciting stuff happening that has completely taken meteorological researchers by surprise over the last two or three years is the growth of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence being used in all sorts of things. But one thing we didn't think we'd be able to do with it is replace an NWP model. But a few research groups around the world have been trying to do that over the last few years. And they have amazed us with how successful they've been. Now, they're only working with deterministic forecasts at the moment. They can now, in some respects, match the performance of the ECMWF model, which is the best model in the world. I say in some respects because some ver verification scores, they can actually do better than the ECMWF one, forecasts out to a week ahead or more. But there's other things which are not quite so good or we have lots of questions about still. It is still early days in the, in, in the research. But when they... It takes a huge amount of computing to train these artificial intelligence models. They, they train them on huge numbers of past scenarios, past weather. But once they've trained them, you can run a forecast for one ten thousandth, ten thousandth of the cost of running a conventional weather model. So you can see the scope, the opportunities this offers. It offers the possibility after a bit more development, a bit more improvement in these models, we could possibly run an ensemble of 10,000 members at a cheaper cost than we're currently running an 18 member ensemble, which could give us potentially extremely high detail probability forecasts, including good resolution of the risks of extremes. There's all sorts of science questions to ask still. 
but there's lots of very exciting possibilities looking ahead. And we could see the whole way we go about forecasting changing dramatically over the next decade. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Many thanks, Ken. Thanks for a fascinating talk, Susan. And thanks for the apologies for rushing again to our technical glitches, but I think that worked. It's great and a fascinating talk. Good. I will open the floor initially to the live audience. Any questions? And as Ron says, hopefully we can actually bring in questions from the moment. Uh, firstly, welcome to the back there. Um, I was going to ask about the uh, is that my phone's working, is it? The question about the, the skill forecasting. I think the variables have changed. I can't quite they were, but presumably they're quite broad. The verification plots that are shown. Yeah. Yeah, so. I wondering if it would have been skill forecasting. I think that would be the really that, you're, That's a really, really good question. Um, as I said, to verify. Uh, you need to have a large sample of cases. And of course, if you're starting to talk about an extreme threshold, then you don't get a large sample, you have a very small sample. So the simple answer is no, we can't, <laughs> actually. Um, and funny that you ask, because we've been talking just this week about how we might improve some of our verification of our public weather service forecasts, something that we're always thinking about. And somebody said, oh, yes, well, we need to do much more on the extremes. And I said, we can't. Don't let's waste a lot of research in, in trying to do something that we know is an ill-posed question. So um, I mean, we can do a certain amount, um, but you're never going to get very stable statistics from it. So we, we verify a range of thresholds and try and extrapolate the, in towards, towards the more, more towards the extremes. So if, you're, if you are doing OK at the most common thresholds and then it's gradually getting worse as you go towards higher ones, you, you can extrapolate, it's going to be further worse for the, for the more extreme ones. Um, and of course we can, we can do a certain amount, we can, we can get some information about how we're doing for them, but it is, it is really difficult. One of, the, one of the feedbacks we get most from our operational meteorologists is that the ensembles miss extremes far too much. Um, and that is very much a focus of our research into how to improve the ensemble to better capture the extremes they look at, while at the same time not damaging the overall statistics of the ensemble performance. Um, so that sort of subjective assessment from people like Greg and uh, his colleagues and, and, and the operational team in, in, the, in the main forecast office uh, taking their feedback, and, and, and they play a lot of attention, a lot of interest in those high impact events. Do we capture those? So those sort of subjective assessments are really important too. And that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and well, first of all, I'll say um, increasing the resolution of the ensemble to one and a half kilometers will mean that it will much better resolve things like the gusts, the other Pennines and things, which are or, or the Scottish mountains, which are a really important thing that you're trying to talk, you're talking about. Um, for some variables, I didn't mention this in the talk. When we, uh, for some variables, we apply uh, an orographically aware neighbourhood processing, so we only use neighbourhood points which are at a similar orographic height, which certainly helps to retain that um, detail for things like wind speeds and temperatures and things like that, which are strongly affected by our own. But I agree that those lee gusts, it potentially will not, you, you might still spread out the locations where they happen, and that can be quite predictable. The really nice example is something we don't do at the moment, we possibly ought to think about, is whether we do a, a version without neighbourhood processing specifically for that sort of thing. It's a good, it's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was the easy bit. Do we have any questions online? And is anyone willing to uh, speak up? And we'll try it with the microphone. Yes, raise your hand virtually if anyone does have any questions. Are there any in the chat? 
Yeah, good question. Okay. okay, I think we can hear actually Ken over here. Yeah. Yep. Okay, here we go. Martin. Oh, Martin Young. Martin, if you can uh, ask your question, we should hopefully be able to hear you. Hi, Martin. You're on mute, Martin. I think you're on mute, Martin. I think you're on mute, Martin. Martin, yeah, you can see your lips moving, but you're unmuted still. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> we got Jeff just now. Both of them all colleagues of mine when I was a forecaster. <laughs> okay, we'll go to Jeff. It sounds like Jeff does have sound. Uh, hi, Ken. Um, I also was very interested in the, um, the the impact of sort of showers and and you were just then talking about orographic areas. Um, using the using the neighbourhood idea will make a area of showers look like an area of light rain. So we will lose particularly short duration high intensity showers the sort you might get on an orderly what sort of ideas might you have for putting that sort of stuff back in you know it might be other fields i don't know so i said at the beginning i don't advocate using an ensemble mean if you did an ensemble mean it would do what you're saying but what i'm talking about is doing probabilities so if you do probabilities of a high intensity rainfall threshold then you will retain that information. Now, yes, you will get a, a much smoother picture, but my argument is that um, while the deterministic model will give you something that looks like a radar picture, it, it, it may well be getting those showers in the wrong places. So what we're turning it into is a smoother picture of the real risk of, of, of getting those high intensity showers over a wider area. So yes, it does look much smoother. But also then, of course, by looking at the probability of different intensities of rainfall, then you get a realistic picture of how likely the more severe, heavier showers are. And finally, I'd say that by also looking at the in vicinity probabilities, in other words, the probability that a shower will not just be at where you are, but somewhere within your area, somewhere within 10 kilometers of you or 30 kilometers of you, then you get higher probabilities, more, which, which may appear more significant than, than you do if you're just looking at the point probabilities. Does that answer your question, Jeff? Oh, he's gone. You're on mute again now. Yeah, is that, is that off? Yep. Um, yeah, and of course, the other thing I was thinking about on that is, of course, um, uh, one of my interests has always been the sort of shower lines, coastal um, uh, yeah. shape. And, and, and again, you, you, you worry that just, just um, producing the neighbourhood may well blur out um, some of the uh, detail there. Which is a little similar to the question that was asked here in the room about the gusts and things. Um, and so, uh, the yes, there, there there is a little bit of a risk of that um, with the, with the uh, the neighbourhood processing, um, but you will find you will still get the highest probabilities in the right sort of a lo location. Um, a band around it, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Jeff. We'll try one more time with Martin as a final question. I think Martin. Yes. Can you hear me this time? Yeah, you've got you know, Martin. OK, yeah. but that, that's, that's a relief. I've overcome the technology here. Um, the Met Office app, um, there's quite a few occasions where it's actually quite serious and seriously in error as regards rainfall in the period like north to three hours ahead, sometimes quite dramatically, which yeah. is actually quite a reputational problem. Do you yeah. think Improver will actually lead to a, lead to some significant improvements in that. I mean, it was a nice example just a few days ago when we had some uh, thunderstorm develop across Dorset. And um, um, that was a nice example of what's happened quite often. So you're going to get a much more probabilistic picture with the new one. Um, and 
you so I think one thing is that with the current system, we tend to get a horrible jump between a now cast in the very short period and then a model forecast uh, uh, um, a few hours in where the you, if you look at a, a, a map sequence of it, an animation, you see the showers from the radar sort of fading out and then new ones pop it, fading in from the, uns, from the model, different time, and it looks horrible. With Improver, we get a probabilistic picture, which looks a much better animation through time. And in terms of what you get for individual locations, you will have a probabilistic story right from the early from the, from the first frame, which is um, certainly the probability of precipitation will be better. Um, the symbols, I think, will be uh, as good, but I think we're still doing a bit of optimization. There's still opportunity to do a bit more optimization to get the symbols even better um, as we go forward. But I think they'll be as good at least, and um, um, hopefully get, uh, we'll improve further as we go on. So what sort of time scale will we see those sort of in, improvements? Because also know there's some quite significant issues when it's drizzly precipitation, which you get a lot of um, in the southwest. Um, and I know obviously very much take the point about uh, um, use of probabilities and interpretation, but there's a lot of occasions where I have seen the app going for say 10% probability of precipitation, and it's clearly been drizzling for uh, quite a while. And um, I sometimes have quite a bit of explaining in my local walking group when that, uh, right, that yes, situation yes. happens. Um, well, jo broadly speaking, I think you'll see the probabilities will be a lot better with the new, um, the new version, which incidentally I've already got on my phone. There's a test version running and, 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 and we should have it on uh, driving everybody's phone within a few months, I think. Um, but um, drizzle, as you know, Martin, is a problem partly because the radar sometimes just doesn't see it because um, uh, the beam can go over the top of the, the cloud that's producing the drizzle. Mm -hmm. um, and the models don't always capture it all that well either. So we can't magically improve that with just the ensemble post-processing. Um, so I think we, I'm, I'm, we, we obviously will look working on ways we can improve drizzle as well, but I think drizzle will not necessarily improve with this particular change. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Thanks all. In the interest of time, I'll probably wrap it up there. Um, once again, our sincere thanks, Ken, for your talk well. and for everyone for um, their patience and uh, getting through the IT. But uh, hopefully that's worked. Uh, feedback is very welcome from those that are attending online as to how we make it a bit slicker next time. But uh, I think that was an overall success and uh, good to be up and running. So our next talk is the 10th of November. Uh, we've got Professor Haley Fowler from uh, Newcastle University talking. Um, so hopefully we'll see some of you in person and uh, online as well. And for that, good evening, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much.